My name is Greg Endress. I, I work as an extension agronomist out of the Carrington Research Extension Center. I'll be serving as one of the moderators for this, this first uh, panel session. And uh, the second moderator is uh, David Kramer. And David, would you introduce yourself, please? Sure. My name is uh, David Kramer, and I am the Precision Agriculture Specialist at the Carrington Research Extension Center. Um, so I'll be co-moderating this with uh, Greg today. So thanks for attending. All right, so I'm going to move to a screen share to, to give you, uh, I show a few slides just to give you a background of what we plan to do in the next 50 minutes. Okay, so as mentioned, this is our, our first uh, speaker panel session on crop pest management. And I'd like to point out that there were a lot of people involved with planning this session. Um, all NDSU extension personnel and those are listed. And then we're, we really appreciate the, the new sponsors that, that helped make this program uh, take place. And those are, are listed as well. So here's our, our plans for the format for the panel. Uh, we do have 50 minutes planned and um, we'll start with having the, the speakers very briefly introduce themselves and then give a concise summary of the subjects that they discussed in the, the pre-recorded videos. And the main part of the, the program, of course, will be to um, have the audience ask questions. And our, our main way of, of uh, asking the questions, we would ask that to use the, the chat box. And we'll, we'll talk about that um, a little bit later and how to do that, just in case you're not aware of, of the procedure. For those of you that are certified crop advisors, we do have uh, one CU available for you. And uh, to get that, that continuing education unit, uh, we'll tell you about that at, at the end of the program. But very simply, it's a matter of using the QR code. And then um, like other uh, extension programs, we'd really appreciate if you would give us your comments on, on how you value the program. And so we'll ask to have you uh, complete a, a fairly uh, simple evaluation, uh, either at the end of this session or if you're planning to attend other sessions during the day, you only have to do it once today. And so whatever session you end with, um, we'd like to have you complete that evaluation. We have six speakers that did the pre-recordings on the, the subject of crop pest management, and we're gonna split this up into twos. So the first group that'll visit with you and ask your questions uh, during the first half of the 50 minutes are those listed. Andrew Friskup and Sam Markell, our extension plant pathologists. And, um, and then Jan Knoll, hopefully she'll be joining us. And she's our extension entomologist. And then the, the specific subjects that they covered in the videos are, are listed. And, um, and then go ahead and, and ask um, Andrew to begin the introductions. Again, introduce yourself, Andrew, and then, and then a, a quick summary of, of uh, the high points of, of uh, corn, yellow rust, and Goss's wilt. Well, thanks, Greg. Uh, thanks to the committee for uh, inviting me and some of the other speakers uh, to uh, speak to you virtually and have this question and answer. So my name is Andrew Friskup. I'm a cereal crop extension plant pathologist, and my program is heavily geared on the management of diseases in corn and the small grain crops in the state. And for this specific event, I uh, made a video highlighting uh, specifically two diseases in corn. One is Goss's wilt, which is our number one corn disease in the state. Uh, really hitting the high points of the importance of hybrid resistance and how that can alleviate a lot of the yield loss concerns with that disease. And the second half of the presentation was on Southern rust, which is a, I call it a new disease for the state. And the implications of this is that although it is a new disease it arrived very late, it overwinters down in the South, actually in the tropical regions. And because it arrived so late, we didn't see much yield loss, but the important question to ask is, it's a tropical disease that we did find in North Dakota last year. And I found it in a couple locations and just wanted to highlight um, what it looks like and uh, more importantly, what, what we can interpret as uh, when we find that. So that was the premise of most of the presentation. Uh, and just kind of wanted to hit the high points on that. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, next, uh, we ask Sam Raquel to, to give us uh, the introduction of, of himself, and then uh, three 
diseases that he talked about relating to soybean, uh, soybean cyst nematode, a sudden death syndrome, and then uh, a new one, frog eye leaf spot. So Sam, take it away. Thank you, Greg. Good morning, everyone. I'm an extension plant pathologist working on broadleaf crop diseases. So I'm Andrew Friskop's counterpart. So soybean, sunflower, canola, dryads, et cetera. Uh, my presentation earlier was on those three soybean diseases Greg talked about. It was very interesting late August and early summer, probably for all the wrong reasons. It was, it was warm and factors, the environmental factors were really conducive to some diseases. We saw SCN, so soybean cyst nematode expand. Again, in the state, we saw some pretty hard hit fields. Um, we saw sudden death syndrome, which is a root pathogen that will kill soybeans. And we'd only previously seen it in 2018 and only in Richland County. And we had a confirmation in Cavalier, so quite a ways away. And then we saw frog eye leaf spots show up. So this is a foliar disease of soybeans. And really until this point, we've never had a foliar disease on soybeans that really caused yield loss. I, I would count white mold as a stem disease. Um, we saw this widespread in the Southeast part of the state. And we've since learned that the a good amount of the frog eye we, saw, we found is actually resistant to strobilar and fungicides. And that is consistent with what's going on in the eye states and in the, the Mid-South where soybeans are grown. Thank you, Sam. And then Dr. Jan Canole has joined us. Jan is our extension entomologist. And in Jan's uh, pre-recorded uh, video presentation, she talked about some new midges in the state, soybean midges, the gall midge and white mold midge. So Jan, I'm here. Yeah, <laughs> would you please uh, introduce yourself oh, okay. and, and uh, <laughs> give a concise summary about uh, what you talked about on the video regarding sure. soybean midges? Uh, yeah, I think I know uh, most of you, but those of you who don't know me, as I'm Jan Canodal, the extension entomologist for NDSU. And thanks to Greg and everyone else who helped organize the Central Dakota Ag Day today. And I'm going to just talk about two midges that are occurring in soybeans. Uh, one is an invasive insect pest, the soybean gall midge, and it can cause economic yield loss on soybeans. And then the other one is not an economic pest, the white mold gall midge. And I'm going to talk about how you can distinguish between the two species of midge and what they look like and where they can be found and how to scout for them and then what to do if you find the soybean gall midge. Okay, thank you, Jan. All right, so you heard from the, the three speakers and uh, regarding <clears throat> plant pathology and entomology. So now it's, it's your turn as an audience. And as I mentioned earlier, we'd prefer to have the, the questions uh, brought through the chat box. Um, if you're not familiar with using the chat box, it's actually very simple. On the bottom of your, of your screen, you find uh, a number of icons and there's one about in the middle on the bottom of the screen that says chat. If you click on that, you find that it should show on the right hand margin of the screen. And then on the bottom, it says simply type message here. And so if you type your question there, uh, David will be monitoring those. And if there, there would happen to be a number of questions that come up that are similar, he might compile those and then just have one summary question. But please, we'd really appreciate having your questions. And um, if there's some silent period, um, we do have some other questions that uh, we'll bring forward to the, the three panel members. So with that, um, um, please go ahead and, and uh, enter your, your questions in the chat box. Maybe to begin the discussion, I, I will start with a, a question. And I'll start with um, Andrew Friskop. You know, Andrew, you had talked about Goss's wilt. And, and um, we don't have a lot of irrigated corn in the state, but it would just seem that the irrigated corn would be at much higher risk on a, a normal year in North Dakota for or uh, having the disease infection. Um, is that correct? And also, even a year with very high moisture levels, such as in 2019, where we had excessive moisture, especially toward the end of the season, I would assume that would put the crop at a much higher risk for this disease. Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. Uh, so a lot of the, 
I guess p potential answers for this is, you know, how does this bacteria work and how, what type of environmental conditions? Uh, the bacteria prefers, you know, I call very human-like conditions, 75 to 85 degrees, which we generally have. And often the biggest thing is any type of damage or anything to help move that bacteria from one leaf surface to another. So for example, with irrigation, um, if you have gossip wilt in the field and you have overhead irrigation, you can spread that pathogen. And I think a really good example of this and not to pick on you, Greg, but there was a field that I still remember very well that was south of the, of the Carrington station uh, that had a very high level of gossip wilt incidence. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is we know it was burnt up relatively quickly before maturity. But the thing is, is anywhere where that end pivot gun wasn't reaching uh, the, the corners of the crop was very green. And the idea in this is it wasn't able to spread that bacteria to the far corners of, of the field because it didn't have that water source. So irrigation definitely can spread it, definitely gonna create uh, that uh, conducive environment. And as far as rainfall amounts, uh, generally when you get rain, you, know, you will get some severe weather with that. And the combination of those is going to create that wound to allow the bacteria to get in. And those are all risk factors. So if I had to put it under a, as far as relative risk, uh, irrigated acres are at most risk, especially if it's corn on corn, uh, no-till and have those other factors. Um, so I've had two questions pop up in the chat, Sam, both of these are for you. Um, first question is from Jeff Gale. Uh, do you have any initial report from SCN soil sampling that went on this fall? Sure. The, I talked to AgBias, who's our, our partner lab. Um, I talked to them yesterday and they so far have processed 623 samples. They have over two dozen in the queue still. So there's probably at least 650 that were taken, maybe maybe 700 by the time it's all done. Um, we are gonna draft a tentative map. Um, actually this week, I should have it in my hands on Friday. Um, the North Dakota Soybean Council is supporting it, so I'll send it right to Kendall and I can send this one to you as well. Just keep in mind that it will change a bit um, by January because all the ones in the queue and the ones that were taken later um, are not gonna be represented in this first initial map. Uh, where SCN is occurring and that sort of thing, I don't know yet. I, I won't know until I see that initial map. All right, the uh, second question is from, if I, if I butcher the last name, I apologize, uh, apologize. Sarah Lovas. She says she has a question about frog eye leaf spot. Um, isn't that a circospora type pathogen? Is it related to uh, circospora leaf spot and sugar beet? Consider statements on uh, Stromberlerin resistance, how we think about managing frog eye leaf spot. Do soybeans and sugar beet growing areas need to be more concerned or managed any differently? Okay, uh, thanks, Sarah. So yes, they, they are both Cercospora pathogens. The frog eye leaf spot on soybeans is Cercospora sergina. The, the sugar beet Cercospora is Cercospora meticula. So they're related, but they're not the same. That's relevant, I think, for a couple of reasons. The first is that we've never had frog eye leaf spot up here, and it's generally considered a warmer environment uh, pathogen. Uh, but we know Cercospora reticula can survive for 22 months on residue, and we know that the frog eye leaf spot pathogen on soybeans can survive for 24 months in northern Illinois. So the first and maybe most important thing is we, we expect it to overwinter which I, I kind of was hoping that the data would suggest otherwise, but we expect this thing to overwinter. So regarding yield loss though, uh, that relates to the time that frog eye might show up in soybeans. So if you see frog eye show up as soon as they canopy, R1, R2, then, then it could be a yield concern. But keep in mind, warmer weather is more favorable for this disease. So we're, we're often relatively cool at that time of the season. But if it starts to show up in the canopy, it might be a cause for concern. Um, yeah, so strobilurin fungicides, uh, headline, quadris, approach, and those that have those chemistries and premixes, something like Cryaxer, it looks like they're not gonna be very effective to help manage at least some of the frog eye loose spot we have here. And, and I, think, I think that warrants maybe a little bit further explanation. So years and years ago, frog eye leaf spot uh, was causing quite a bit of yield loss in the Mid-South. So I, I would say the I-States and then South where it was favorable. And there were a lot of strobilurins put down. So this would have been a 
10, 15 years ago, they were kind of new, pretty common. And over time, the pathogen adapted to that. And whatever we got in North Dakota is blown up from that area over time sequentially. And so it's already resistant to the strobilarins. Now that's not to say that every isolate that we had is resistant, they're not, it's a mix. But because the mix looks like it's about 50% resistant and 50% not, you, you can't expect to be able to manage this by just a strobilarin fungicide alone. Um, I don't think this has any bearing on sugar beet sensor cospra. It's a different pathogen. It shouldn't cause any different problems. It should, it should not be able to recombine or anything like that with the cercospora in particular. Um, I think the high points here would be that we expect it to overwinter. If it's warm and humid, we might see it. And we do know fungicides are a good management tool, but not strobilarins. Does that answer your questions? I think that was a thumbs up. Uh, from Austin Lang to Janet, regarding insect pests such as aphids, midge, et cetera, can a person accept or, or expect or accomplish some reasonable control biologically? How much benefit could I expect if I develop small pockets of beneficial insect habitat and field borders? Okay, well, that's a good question, Austin. <laughs> um, for the midge, um, the soybean gall midge is not here yet, but it's right on our borders in Minnesota and South Dakota. And um, the other one, the white mold gall midge is not economic, so it feeds on white mold. So <laughs> it's actually sort of a beneficial, but it doesn't feed enough to control the white mold. So you still need to manage that. But for aphids, we have seen where the predators, there's many predators, the lady beetles are probably the one that most people are familiar with, but there's lacewings and there's a parasitoid uh, that attacks it. So there's quite a few uh, predators that feed on it and it, they are um, effective in controlling soybean aphid. I've had many insecticide trials ruined <laughs> by predators moving in and removing all of my soybean aphids. So it just depends on the year and whether the conditions are favorable for soybean aphid population growth. If we're in the low 80s, you know, moderate humidity conditions are fairly favorable. But if we get hot or cooler, that'll, well, both, both extremes slow the population growth of soybean aphid. So then the predators have a better chance of catching up to the uh, aphids and controlling them. And there's been a lot of papers published on this um, in terms of we don't really have anything we can release, but we just rely on natural control. And there's been a lot of work now on habitat modification and planting flowers and other um, natural um, occurring flowers in the shelter, you know, the shelter belts can actually help um, enhance beneficial insect populations. Thank you, Jan. I've got a question for you as well. Uh, regarding the, the white mold gall midge, you know, we've had white mold in the state for generations and mm -hmm. um, I find it strange that it's just very recently that we've discovered the insect. Was it we just weren't looking for it? And then the second part of the question is that um, we don't consider it economic. Is it because it's just minimal feeding or is it because it's just present so late? Or maybe the impact of the white mold just overwhelms a little bit of feeding damage that the, the insect uh, causes. Yes, it's... Um been around here for a long time. Um, it's actually been recorded. Um, it's native to North America and it's been found on many different crops that have white mold, uh, dry beans, sunflowers. So it's been here for well over 25 years. It's just a small insect. It's very, very tiny. And the difficulty that we're having right now, I think why we're starting to see it is because of the soybean gall midge, which looks identical to it. 
And that's kind of what my video talks about is how to separate based on the characteristics of where they're found on the plant and where they're found in the field. Because physically, these two insects are almost identical. So they're very difficult to ID. But no, the white mold gallmage has been here for a long time. <laughs> it's up in Canada, Minnesota. Um, I will throw out a question just kind of open-ended to all the panelists. Um, from, from what I've gathered watching the videos or watching the, the presentations, a lot of these uh, issues seem to be at least to some extent uh, weather climate driven in terms of warmer weather or higher rainfall. Um, what do you see the long-term implications of this being um, as we experience some of the changes in climate and things and what's what impact is that going to have on uh, seeing increases in this this type of distribution of some of these issues? I guess I would maybe suggest that, you know, we have a lot of climatic or weather fluctuations every year. And with pathogens, you do tend to see, you know, you get cold and wet, you get an explosion of white mold, you get hot and dry, you maybe have charcoal rot on soybeans or rust epidemics or something like that. The longer we stay in this wet cycle, the longer we have the heat, we will, at least in the broadleaf crops, we will continue to see some of these pathogens that we're not used to dealing with, like frog eye, leaf spot, uh, remain around and potentially be problematic. But if the weather pattern changes, they will, they will effectively go away. They just won't, they, they just will always be present now as opposed to uh, like frog eye. Was, we never had any record of it in the state. Um, I, think it, I think it also in some crops like soybeans that's expanded dramatically in the last couple decades, maybe corn would be in this bucket as well. We would expect to see some of these diseases uh, increase over time just simply because we have greater acreage and we haven't had the issue before. Um, things will expand up like soybean cyst nematode did 15 years ago. Uh, I was going to add a little bit on what Sam said. Dude. Yeah, I, I think of the pathogens that are able to hold forward here in North Dakota. We're essentially married to them. Um, and from there, we uh, look at management and we, we'll, we'll see some more uh, problematic during the, the wet, warm years. But like Sam mentioned, we have some that are dry years. And for example, with Goss's wilt, we can find it in Fairmont, North Dakota in the southeast corner. And I've had reports all the way up in Crosby, up in Divide County. So the, the idea is if we have the pathogen, it's some of the other factors like weather that will drive how much we see in a year. It's going to make management a little bit more complex, really, I think, in a nutshell. I have to be a little bit more attentive to things that we didn't pay much attention to in the past. Now for, for insects pests, we're already seeing changes in the complex of pests that we have in soybeans. We're seeing more of the southern insects um, starting to infest our soybean fields like stink bugs. Um, Ten years ago, we hardly saw a stink bug in our soybean fields, but now you can go out and see them quite easily. So, and there's many invasive insect pests um, that are gonna do well, like the brown marmorated stink bug. We haven't found it here in North Dakota, but we've had a couple of um, cases where it's been detected in shipping material that was shipped to North Dakota. It was during the winter, so I don't expect them to survive. But there's many different you know, I can see it in the migratory insect pests. They get up here earlier because they're overwintering further north. So it's, it's uh, already occurring. Um, Janet, we have one more question for you um, from Sarah again. This, it's off topic a bit, but per beneficial insects and soybean aphids with insecticides like Transform and others that target sap feeding insects and are less harmful to beneficial insects, do you think we could ever see the aphid threshold for treatments change to include beneficials and their effect on the aphid populations? Uh, yes, there is a threshold out there. It's on an app. It was developed up in Canada. I think it's called the aphid app. I have to look that up. But um, yes, it takes into account all of the predators out there like lady beetles. And you and when you're scouting, you also scout for the, the predators and you enter the number of predators that are out there, the number of aphids that you see that are parasitized by a parasit 
parasitic wasp. And then that takes into how we know how many aphids they eat per day. So that is taken into account and it is subtracted from the soybean aphid population growth rate. So it gives you a threshold that takes, it doesn't change the threshold, but it takes all the beneficial insects into account. So it would lower your, you know, potential of reaching the known economic threshold of 250 aphids per plant. Perfect. So and I, I'll try to, um, I, yeah, if you want to email me, I'll try to get that. I can't remember the, if you Google soybean aphid and beneficial apps, and it was up in Canada, um, you'll probably find it. I think it's just aphid app. All right. Um, I think that's going to wrap up our time for right now. Um, if you have any other questions, and I'm sure Greg can chime in, um, feel free to email. Thank you.